This is the Ford Everest seven seat wagon and it is all new for 2022. It is the spiritual successor to the Ford Territory and just like the Territory, it has the potential to be the perfect car for active Aussie families. Now there are some worthy contenders that it needs to overcome to take that crown, including 2022 Drive Car of the Year finalists, the Toyota Fortuna, Isuzu MUX and Mitsubishi Pajero Sport. But if it is going to take the crown, there's really only one car it has to beat. And that's this one, the incredibly capable and always popular Toyota Land Cruiser Prado. Believe it or not, this generation of Prado has been around since 2009 and after a series of evolutions has ended up with the car that you see here. It is the top selling large SUV in Australia so far in 2022 and it's held that top seller title all the way back to 2012. As a matter of fact, the last time that it came second in the sales race was in 2011 and that was to another Ford product, the Australian built Ford Territory. It's basically the default option for Aussie families that want to tow tour or head off road or maybe even those that just want to load up the kids on the weekend and get out of town. So we're going to put these two seven seat off-road wagons up against each other. We're going to test them in the city and in the country. We're going to have a look at the interior space and the comfort. We're going to analyze the equipment and the safety that you get for your money and at the end of that we should be able to decide which one is the best choice for Aussie families. But before we get started, do us a favour and like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel so that when Drive drives new cars, you hear about it first. Now the first thing you need to know about this new generation Everest is it is a major evolution of the previous generation. Evolved platform, evolved mechanicals and significant steps up in safety, technology and equipment. Now there are four specification levels, kicking off with the Ambiente five seat rear wheel drive at around $53,000. Then you step up to the Trend, the off-road focused Sport, and the Platinum that we're testing here, which is $78,000. None of those prices include on-road costs. Now seven seats is optional on the Ambiente, but it's standard on the rest. And it's going to be very important to this car's appeal to Australian families. In fact, the seven seats is a huge reason why the Toyota Land Cruiser Prado has been so popular for so long. Now up front we've got a cabin that is a huge step up over its predecessor and that's saying something because previous generation Everest was not exactly an embarrassment in this regard. Obviously the headline act is this 12 inch multimedia infotainment display, touchscreen of course, and it's mounted portrait not landscape like most of its rivals tend to do. It incorporates all the wireless phone mirroring you could want. It's also got climate controls, but we've got hard controls here as well for easy access. We've got satellite navigation, digital radio, and all the media playback functions. It works really well. It's intuitive to use. It's partnered by a 12 inch digital display in the driver's instrument cluster, which I've got to admit contains a lot of information. But Ford's been clever in the way they've laid it out and it never looks cluttered and it never makes it hard to see your speed or your fuel economy. You know, those numbers that you want to look at quite regularly. I do think Ford's missed one trick though with this cabin. There is no head up display and on an $80,000 car, well heck, on a car that's brand new in 2022, I think that's an oversight. Okay, now for the basics. Seats are full leather, they breathe as well, and they are heated. They're also, of course, electrically adjustable, which combined with this steering wheel that has a pretty decent amount of adjustment range makes for a really good driving position. This dashboard, though, it is quite high up, and if you've got smaller passengers, like my 150 centimeter wife, it can feel a bit claustrophobic in here. Of course, you can counter that by raising the seat, the passenger seat, but what that does is make it harder to get in and out of what is quite a tall car. All right, what else have we got in here? Well, we have got a Bang & Olufsen 12 speaker sound system, and of course, we've got a couple of cup holders, we've got bottle holders in the door, and the obligatory phone charging mat, and a couple of USB ports under there. Not a massive amount of storage for everyday clutter, but this Platinum does offer not one, but two glove boxes for putting stuff out of sight. And of course, the armrest under here. All right, let's jump in the back seat and see how second row passengers fare. Okay, before I jump into the car, I just wanna show you the seat slide function, 60-40 slide. 
and through quite a range, which means you can help those poor third row passengers get a bit more legroom. All right, jumping up in here. And it is quite a way up, so smaller humans will have to really haul themselves up. Lucky you've got this hand grab rail and you've also got side steps. But once you're in, Look at that, loads and loads of leg room. For the record, that's my seating position, my driving position. Headroom's not too bad. I wouldn't say massively generous, but I'm okay. Obviously, the full leather interior continues back here. Heated outboard seats, which is really cool. We've also got a fan controller here, so we can increase the fan coming through these air vents up here and of course we've got speakers for the second row of passengers we've got usb ports so they can charge whatever device they happen to be using and when they're not using it store it in this seat back map pocket or in the door pocket which looks like it's about the right size to take a bottle but not much else in terms of cup holders we've got a couple in here but before i talk about them you remember the Ford Ranger release was a really finicky, tricky one to use? This one's just a pull. It's very simple. Here's those cup holders I mentioned. Nice leather armrest for resting your arm on. Unlike the Ranger though, the Everest does not have a little phone pocket on the leading edge of the seat base, which is a bit of a shame. We of course have obligatory ISOFIX in the outboard seats. And that's about it. So let's jump into the really cheap seats. All right, the big test. Let's see how easy it is to get in to the third row. One lever on the top, seat slides forward. All right, how do we do this? Clamber in and collapse into the back seat. Actually, you know what? Headroom's not too bad back here. Legroom, let's see how we... Oh, there goes my feet. Well, actually, well, I'd be okay here on short trips, not too bad. I've sat in some third rows where my necks had to really crank over in order to fit in. This is not generous for adults, but I think anyone under, say, let's say 15 years of age wouldn't have too much of a problem back here, which is pretty impressive. Okay, what have we got back here? Well, we've got a couple of air vents up here to keep the airflow going. There is a 12 volt charger on the left hand side and each occupant back here gets a cup holder. And in fact, the left hand side occupant also gets an iPad holder as well. The Platinum's panoramic sunroof is big, but it only stretches over the first two rows of seating, so it's not enough to get back here for occupants in the third row. But we do have these little portholes, so it doesn't feel too claustrophobic back here. Apart from that, there's really not much else to talk about, so why don't we jump in the boot and see what we can see there. Okay, the Ford Everest Platinum has electric tailgate, as you can see. And with all seven seats in position, we've got around 239 litres of cargo space. Not a massive amount, but it is a seven-seater, remember, and 239 is actually bigger than a lot of its competitors. Under this little floor here, we've got another little storage bin, maybe for your wet shoes after hiking, and a storage area over here. Now, because this is a seven-seater, Ford's package protected it by putting the spare tyre, a full-size spare, underneath. Folding this third row, is really easy, couple of buttons on the side, and voila, we've got 898 litres of storage space. If you fold the second row as well, and it does fold relatively flat, that grows to 1,823 litres of space. That is a lot for anyone. The Prado Kakadu you see here sits at the top of the Prado range, which starts from just under $61,000 for the Prado GX, steps up through GXL and VX, and stretches to $87,000 plus on-road costs for the flagship Kakadu. All Prado models feature the same 2.8 litre turbo diesel four-cylinder engine, mated to a six-speed automatic transmission and full-time four-wheel drive. This top shelf version also picks up features like a power folding third row of seats, a sunroof, wood grain look interior trim, JBL premium audio, heated and ventilated front seats, heated second row seats, LED headlights, and 19 inch alloy wheels. Inside the Prado, you have a choice of black or beige for the leather trim. And if you're in any way active or outdoorsy, I would highly recommend the black as the safe choice. Design is where the Prado betrays its age. While all of the surfaces are well finished and nicely put together, the dials and the storage within the cabin aren't aligned with other cars in the segment. You get these big comfy seats, which are more like lounge chairs than car seats. 
The front seats are electrically adjustable, plus there's seat heating and ventilation, and the driver's seat has a two position memory, but you don't get the cool quilted trim of the Everest. Ahead of the driver, there's a set of analog gauges and a small digital display for trip computer info. The nine inch infotainment system isn't as big as that of the Everest, but it is positioned high in the dash and that makes it easy to read. It comes with Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, digital radio and inbuilt navigation. Plus, there's a 14 speaker JBL sound system. As you move down the center stack, most of the space is dedicated to the off-road modes. Uh, so you've got access there for things like multi-terrain select, crawl control, and high and low range. Storage space as a result is a little bit slim. There's one little pocket there and that shelf won't hold much at all. And you've got a littered cup holder cover there, which is actually positioned pretty cleverly to be out of the way of everything else. As well as that, there's a bit of a Land Cruiser favorite here. Under the center armrest, you've got a cool box that you can put a couple of cans in and keep things icy cold on long trips. Second row passengers get a really roomy back seat with generous legroom and heaps of headroom and width to stretch out into. In Kakadu spec, the outboard rear seats are heated, plus there's a third climate control zone for the rear of the cabin. The seats themselves can slide and recline, letting you mix and match cargo space or third row legroom with long haul comfort. Drop down the center armrest and you'll find a pair of cup holders. Plus there's big bottle holders in each of the doors. And finally up here, you'll find a Blu-ray entertainment system. So you can play your old discs and the rear passengers can listen to those on the included wireless headphones. So I want to show you the third row of seats, but to do that, I've got to start in the second row because when you open this door, it doesn't actually open all that far and you get a little gap here, but to get into the third row, all you need to do is pull a single lever and you can load from the curb side with a single seat. You've just got to squeeze in past that seat and pop yourself into the third row. Now, I don't know if you'll be able to see or not, but my feet are already kind of past where the second row ends. So there's not a lot of foot room as you would expect. The third row isn't as big as the second row, but it is actually big enough for me to sit up and I'm 169 centimeters tall. You get a bottle holder on each side and a vent overhead. Plus, if you need to, you can fold down that section as a pass through for longer items. But I think the cool thing about the Prado's third row of seats is that they're electrically deployable. Now I can adjust my backrest electrically, but I can also completely fold the seat from the switches when it wants to work. So that'll fall flat into the floor and I can do the same with this one. The switches on this side and the switches inside the boot. So there's no heavy seat to lug up and down. It's literally all taken care of, provided you can put up with it moving fairly slow. Don't look for a powered tailgate here. The Kakadu might be the top shelf Prado, but with only a side hinged rear door, there's no power assistance. You do get this though which is a separate opening rear glass. So you don't have to open the whole tailgate if space is limited, but you might get a little bit dirty as you uh, reach in to put your shopping in. Swing the boot open and you'll find a narrow 120 litres of boot space. That is just enough to squeeze in a couple of grocery bags. Flick these switches here though, and the rear seats drop into the floor, opening up 620 litres of space. Much more suitable for camping gear, sports kit, or a heavy duty Costco shop. If you wanna go further still, the second row of seats can be manually stowed, unlocking a total capacity of 1800 liters. It is worth noting that despite solid size all round, the Prado comes in just under the Everest at each step. The one thing that the Prado has over the Everest is this, it's a three pin household socket. So that means I can plug my hair straightener in there and turn my camping weekend into a glamping weekend. Okay, we're in the Ford Everest Platinum, and for those of you who like to know about the oily bits, this one's running a new 3-litre turbo diesel engine. But here's a trivia question for you. It may be new to the Everest, but when was it first in a Ford? 
Full points if you happen to answer 2011, and even more points if you said it was in an Australian-made Ford. That's right, the Ford Territory. Okay, not in three litre form. That one got a 2.7 litre turbo diesel. But my point is, this engine can actually trace its heritage back that far. Obviously, it's had a lot of updates over the years. And in current guys, it's putting out 184 kilowatts and 600 newton metres of torque, which are both more than the Prado gets from its 2.8 litre. So on-road performance, as you'd expect, is more robust. It's got more acceleration, greater pull. It's also hooked up to a 10-speed automatic, which in my opinion is about two or three gears more than anyone ever needs. But it seems to have the smarts to change gears at the right time and give me the gear I want for acceleration. So I won't complain about that. Suspension is independent up the front and live axle in the rear, which is what you want in a car with good towing credentials and good off-road credentials. Although you do feel it in the ride a little bit around town, the rear end is definitely more stiffly sprung than the front. Now if you're serious about off-roading, and if you're looking in Everest, it's a fair bet you are, then you'll be happy to hear that this one has a dual range transfer case, which is fantastic when the going gets tough. We're not gonna do a lot of tough off-roading here, but for those of you who don't know what a transfer case does, remember back to your 10-speed bicycle and that second cog on the front that you used to drop it into when you were going up steep hills? Basically the same thing. It gives you a whole nother set of ratios for really tough terrain. And if towing is your thing, well, you'll be glad to hear that the Everest has a full 3.5 tonne towing capacity. Now that's fantastic, that's not best in class, it is equal to best in class, and the Everest is not the only one in its class to have three and a half tonnes, but that is pretty much the max until you move up to those big American trucks like the Silverado or the F-150. Now let's talk a little bit about ownership costs. You've shelled out around 82 grand to get this car in your driveway, and the fuel consumption so far, we're running at 10.2 litres per 100, a fair bit of urban driving so far, but we are now getting out to the country, so I'd expect that to drop into the nines. What other costs are you gonna be up for? Servicing? Ford's actually done a pretty good deal here. In the first four years, the most you'll pay if you take out their cap price servicing is $329 a year. Now for a car with this many complicated systems, that's a pretty good deal. Now, in terms of safety, You'll be glad to hear that ANCAP has crash tested the Everest and has found it worthy of a full five star rating. So you can be assured, if you do get in a pickle, that it will protect you and your family as well as can be expected. As for active safety inclusions, Ford hasn't scrimped on those either. Obviously, we've got the full suite of autonomous emergency braking systems. We've also got a blind spot warning. We've got lane keeping assist. We've also got lane departure warning. It doesn't have blind spot assist, which I'm a bit disappointed in because an $80,000 car should. Blind spot assist. So blind spot warning, if there's a car in your blind spot and you go to change lanes, it beeps at you and flashes at you. Blind spot assist, if you try to steer into that lane, it tries to prevent you. This car doesn't do that. And a lot of cars at a lot cheaper price point do. So Ford needs to get that on this car quickly. And to be honest, it's got the hardware. I said it's got lane keep assist. So it will steer me to stay in the lane. There's nothing stopping it, apart from a few lines of software, stopping me from changing into the wrong lane at the wrong time. Okay, now I told you this Ford Everest has five star ANCAP rating. It's also got nine airbags, just like the Ranger, which includes a front center airbag to stop the driver and the front occupant hitting each other in a crash. It's also got full curtain airbags down the side and knee airbags for both front seat occupants as well. Now, a couple of inclusions on this Platinum spec, which add to its safety suite. It has a 360 degree camera, which is fantastic for parking in tight spaces. It also has autonomous parking assist, which is fantastic, and LED matrix headlights. Let's kick off by talking about what's under the bonnet of this Prado. So, there's a 2.8 litre engine, and that might sound close to the three litres that you get in the Everest, but in this case, it's a four cylinder, not a V6. It's a little bit smaller in capacity, and as a result, it's also a little bit down on power and torque. You get 150 kilowatts here, and 500 newton metres, which 
doesn't sound like a massive difference, but compared to the 184 and 600 of the Everest, it's gonna matter when you're loaded up or towing or just have every seat filled. As a result, the Prado isn't particularly quick around town. This isn't a light car all up and it's not a performance tune by any stretch of the imagination. You get a decent swell of torque and it's enough to keep things rolling around town, but you're not gonna win the traffic light Grand Prix by a long shot. In typical Toyota fashion, this is far from a new powertrain. It was introduced into the Prado in 2015, but as well as that, it does duty in other vehicles like the Hilux, the Hi-Ace, and the Fortuna. The engine pairs with a six-speed automatic, and probably no surprises here, but it doesn't rewrite the rulebook either. Again, it's not the newest tech, but it is reliable and smooth and unobtrusive. This is a transmission that you can simply slot into drive and otherwise forget about. It shuffles off gears smoothly, and it may not be the quickest operator. After all, the Everest has 10 gears to pick from, whereas this can kind of surf its wave of torque and just make do with what it has. Ride comfort is undeniably soft, and if the Everest sets new handling benchmark for the segment, then the Prado firmly keeps its feet in the comfort camp. It'll sail over speed humps and joins in the tarmac with absolute ease. It's definitely the one to opt for if you want the smoothest and most comfortable ride. It'll take anything in its stride with gelatinous ease. While that might sound like I'm making out as if it's boaty, it actually suits the Prado really well. No matter what you do to this thing, it just maintains its composure. You can fill it with people, you can put a boat on the tow bar, and it just stays unfussed and very comfortable across all surfaces. Perfect for cross-country touring. The Prado carries a very old five-star ANCAP rating from 2011. While technology has improved over the years, ANCAP has announced that from the end of this year, ratings will expire after six years, which essentially leaves this car unrated. To balance that, the Toyota Safety Sense suite incorporates autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection, lane departure warning and assist, which brakes the wheel on one side of the car to nudge it into line, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert, traffic sign recognition, and surround view cameras. There is adaptive cruise control, but it's often jerky and slow to react when it does. In a modern context, the Prado is missing a few items that you'll find in other cars. It doesn't have junction assist or reverse AEB. There's no active lane keeping and lane follow assist, and it doesn't have things like blind spot intervention to stop you from moving into the path of another car. And like I mentioned, it has adaptive cruise control, but it doesn't have full stop and go cruise. So while it will bring you down to almost a standstill, it can't hold you there. And these are just more advanced tech items that are finding their way into other cars in the class. Okay, so our road testing has come to an end and as the situation would have it, we're in the Yu Yangs Regional Park. I think Ford's Proving Ground is just over there, so I don't know if this constitutes home ground advantage. Yeah, I feel like we're on some home <laughs> turf for those guys. <laughs> but let's, let's, okay, speaking of ground advantage, let's talk about the ground rules again, okay? We know these two cars are very good at towing and very good off-road. We haven't set out to demonstrate that or test that today. We set ourselves the challenge of testing these cars as an Australian family wagon. So we probably need to figure out a bit of scoring. How do you want to attack that? I guess the easiest place to start with that is obviously price. So in my case, the Prado Kakadu is $87,000 plus on roads. And the Everest Platinum is $78,000 plus on roads, so $9,000 cheaper. That's a fair advantage. But on the other hand, there's some toys that my car has that yours doesn't. So I've got a Trick Kinetic Dynamic Suspension which does some pretty neat stuff off-road, and I realise that's not what we're here to do today, but it means that you can have some on-road stability and some off-road flex. True, my car doesn't have that. It's got a live axle and independent front, and it's decent off-road, but it's not as trick as that. Uh, my car's got some cool stuff to look after occupants, so there is a fridge in the centre console, plus I've got a third zone of climate control, a proper third zone of climate control. Yeah, I don't have that. And we both got electrically folding third row seats, so that doesn't really count. I have got a fairly panoramic sunroof. Uh, I've got a small one. 
Right, okay, so I'll tick that to the Everest. What else the Everest got? Okay, boot space. 898 litres to be exact to the second row, 239 to the third row. Yeah, I'm a long way down on that. I'm 120 to the third row and 680 to the second row, which is a fairly big disadvantage. That is. Okay, let's talk about on-road now. Um, you and I both know the specs and we know the Everest has an extra 100 newton metres of torque, an extra 34 kilowatts of power, but I have been using a fair bit of fuel, 10.1 litres to here. How's the uh, Prado compare? So surprisingly, the Prado isn't that much better. It is down on power, down on torque. Neither of these are new engines, really. They're both getting on in years, but I'm using 9.8 litres per 100. Right, that's not a big difference. That's not a big difference. And you get a lot more performance in the Everest. Okay, now what about safety? I've got autonomous emergency braking, which is pedestrian, cyclist and intersection aware. I have AEB, but it's only cyclist and pedestrians, and I miss out on junctions. Okay, I've got lane departure warning and lane keep assist. I have departure warning, but my assist is by brake, not by steering, which is a bit of an old fashioned and outdated way of doing things. That is a, a previous generation approach to that one, isn't it? Okay, blind spot warning, but I don't have blind spot assist. I'm the same in that regard. <sighs> okay, so that's it. I think that gives us a fairly clear picture now, Kez. What does it tell us about the Prado? Look, I think the Prado has evolved over the years really well. Like we said at the start of the video, this car appeared in 2009 and it isn't a 2009 car now. But at the same time, it doesn't feel like a 2022 car. It's done a really good job of keeping up and it's not hard to see why it's as popular as it is. It's comfortable on the road, it's quiet, and it does a lot of things really well. But I just think that there's a lot of things that the Everest does better. Yeah, I think you're right. I think what we've discovered today is the Ford Everest being a new generation car has new generation tricks, new generation thinking, and new generation approaches to uh, solutions that new car buyers expect today. So there you have it. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, or even if you haven't, do us a favor, hit the like button and make sure you subscribe so the next time we do a comparison, you hear about it first.